Welcome to the MOOC's course Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is Chemicals from C2 Compounds Part 2. Before going into the details of today's lecture, we will have a recapitulation of what we have discussed in the previous few lectures in this particular chapter. We started a chapter on chemicals from C1 and C2 compounds. What do you mean by C1 and C2 compounds? That means, you know, in the compound that you have taken as a raw material, only one carbon atom is there. Let us say CO plus H2 synthesis gas, if you take as raw material, then it is uh, you can regard it as a C1 compound because only one carbon atom is there. Likewise, methane you can take, so which is also having only one carbon atom. So, what we have done uh, under the chemicals uh, to be produced from uh, C1 compounds, we started with production of uh, methanol for which what we have done? We have done catalytic hydrogenation of uh, carbon monoxide or uh, CO plus H2 mixture when you do the catalytic reaction, then you get methanol. This is one compound uh, we produce, one chemical we produced. Then other one is that formaldehyde that we produce where what we have done? We have done two types of methods like methanol you take and then you do oxidation to get formaldehyde and water vapors. This is one method. Other method that we have done is pyrolysis or catalytic pyrolysis of a methanol to give formaldehyde plus hydrogen. These two methods we have seen for the formaldehyde preparation, right? So, uh, the major uh, purpose of uh, methanol application is that production of a formaldehyde because this formaldehyde is having huge applications in resins, etc. So, whatever methanol is produced more than 50 percent is used for production of formaldehyde by either of this process because formaldehyde is having much more applications. Okay. Then uh, chloro methanes also we have seen how to produce chloro methanes. So, here we have taken methane and then Cl2 we have done uh, direct chlorination reactions. So, this reaction we found it as a uh, series reaction where one H atom of uh, methane is being replaced by the uh, one chlorine atom to get uh, chloro uh, methanes plus HCl. So, let us say here whatever form that again reacts with uh, uh, Cl2 to give CH2Cl2 which is nothing but methylene chloride plus HCl. This uh, methylene chloride again reacts with uh, chlorine to give chloroform plus HCl. This chloroform again reacts with Cl2 to give carbon tetrachloride plus HCl. So, HCl is a byproduct and then it produced in huge quantities. Okay? So, that is about the production of uh, uh, chemicals from C1 compounds. Likewise, production of uh, uh, C2 compounds also uh, uh, we have seen and then from those C2 compounds producing different types of chemicals also we have seen. Let us say under the C2 compounds we have taken olefins only because from the petrochemicals industry's point of view olefins are present in less quantities and then those olefins you take and then do some kind of reaction. So, wide spectrum of products you can get. Let us say uh, this uh, steam cracking of hydrocarbons when we have done not only ethylene, ethylene but also several n number of uh, compounds are being produced in the steam uh, cracking of hydrocarbons. Okay? So, that is the reason under the C2 compounds though uh, ethane also comes into the picture we started taking only C2 H4 ethylene and then C2 H2 ethylene. Right? So, uh, before producing chemicals from them production of these themselves we have uh, discussed like you know steam cracking of hydrocarbons if you do let us say Cx H2x plus 2 you take and then do uh, cracking reaction then you get C2 H4 plus C2 H2 plus uh, C3 H6 plus C3 H8 
like that so many compounds you get that is what we have done and then but primarily the reaction conditions are uh, mainly such a way that more of the ethylene and acetylene you get because ethylene is one of the most in fact the most important olefin is ethylene after that acetylene is the second most uh, uh, C2 compound ok. That is based on the application this uh, we decide because ethylene is having huge number of uh, applications compared to the other olefins that are being produced by steam cracking of hydrocarbons right. So then once we have this one from the uh, ethylene and then acetylene what kind of products uh, we can produce that we started. So first we started with ethanol production right synthetic uh, ethanol production by just uh, hydration of ethylene if you do you get the uh, ethanol but uh, fermentation process is mostly used because of uh, you know economics right. Then we started uh, a discussion on EDC ethylene dichloride which is produced by you know a direct chlorination uh, reaction between uh, ethylene and then chlorine or uh, thermal uh, reaction between ethylene and chlorine if you do directly you get Cl, CH2, CH2, Cl which is nothing but ethylene dichloride ok. So this is uh, having you know applications mostly like you know production of uh, vinyl ester these kind of uh, chemicals for the production or uh, vinyl chloride monomer production this ethylene uh, dichloride is in general used and that was the uh, third component that we discussed that can be produced from the C2 chemicals vinyl chloride. So here that is EDC that is ethylene dichloride pyrolysis if you do at high temperature like 500 degrees centigrade then you get CH2, CH, CH, Cl plus HCl which is the CH2, CH, Cl is nothing but the uh, vinyl chloride monomer whereas this Cl, CH2, CH2, Cl is nothing but ethylene dichloride EDC. This is vinyl chloride monomer. This vinyl chloride uh, can also be produced by acetylene and then HCl reaction right. So that also we have discussed ok. This reaction occurs at 160 to 200 degree centigrade whatever the second reaction is there between acetylene and then HCl to give vinyl chloride monomer that is what we have discussed. And then after that we discussed uh, ethylene oxide production which is uh, we got by uh, oxidation of uh, ethylene in the presence of a silver oxide catalyst at about uh, 250 to 300 degrees centigrade and then 4 to 5 atmospheric pressures then we got CH2, CH2 and then O ethylene oxide but uh, impurities CO2 and then water vapors also you get in this reaction right. So up to this part we have discussed on chemicals production from uh, C1 and C2 chemicals. Now uh, some more uh, chemicals we are going to uh, produce from uh, C2 compounds. Now what are those C2 compounds like now we take a, uh, ethylene oxide as a uh, raw material because we have seen ethylene oxide is primarily used for production of ethyl glycol by uh, hydration reaction ok. So that is what we are going to discuss now. So now in this lecture we start with the production of uh, ethylene uh, glycol which you can get by doing the hydration of uh, ethylene oxide ok. Ethylene oxide hydration if you do then you can get uh, uh, ethylene glycol plus polyglycols as well you may get. So this is the starting topic of today's lecture. Since this ethylene glycol is produced by the hydration of ethylene oxide we have a recapitulation of a flow chart on production of a ethylene oxide ok which we have discussed the previous lecture. Uh, uh, anyway ok. So this reaction now here uh, what we have whatever the ethylene that you have that you can compress and then you can take air you can take oxygen also if you take oxygen the reaction is better and then uh, less severe conditions are required as we have discussed previously. So this ethylene and then air you can mix and then send it to a uh, tubular reactor. Uh, this tubular reactor uh, is nothing but a bundle of uh, tubes 
in these tubes what you have uh, silver oxide catalyst packed in right with some kind of promoters if required okay so this uh, uh, this whatever the ethylene and air mixture goes through this uh, uh, tubes then what happens required reaction takes place and then you get the products okay so but these tubes are you know clustered in a uh, shell kind of thing there is a interstitial space because of this uh, bundling uh, of tubes so in the interstitial space what you do you allow some kind of uh, diathems etc to control the you know uh, reaction temperature you don't want the reaction temperature to go beyond 250 to 300 degrees centigrade for that uh, uh, diathem uh, heat transfer fluids are in general used okay now, whatever the product mixture is there, that product mixture is primarily ethylene oxide and then some kind of impurities uh, or uh, unreacted uh, uh, ethylene air etc. So, what you do this uh, product mixture you pass through steam heat uh, boiler uh, you know then so that to you know you reduce the temperature or recover some of the energy from it right. Then whatever the unreacted uh, ethylene air etc are there so those things you can uh, separate out here right and then you can recycle back to the reactor along with the reactant or you can take them as a purge stream also because you do not want so much of gases to be accumulated within the tubes otherwise required reaction may not take place. Then after this step uh, this product mixture whatever is there that you compress and then pass through a uh, water wash absorber right. Here what happens here also if at all some amount of uh, unreacted uh, uh, you know uh, reactant they, they will be collected and then sent back to the uh, waste steam boiler to recover as the energy ok. Then from the bottom of this one you get uh, ethylene oxide absorbed in water so then that you preheat when you preheat so whatever the water is there uh, in the solution that would be evaporated and then passed through will be passed through water absorber as a recycle right. Then after that uh, what you do you send it to the packed bed desorber where you try to strip out the H2O and then you purify whatever the ethylene oxide is there that ma as much as possible. That you take to a stripper because even after the desorption what happens lot of uh, lightens and then H2O may be present. In this may be present in large quantities not in small quantities. So, this stripper is very much essential. In this stripper you remove such water vapors and light ends from the ethylene oxide uh, mixture and then after that you take the ethylene uh, oxide uh, crude to the refining steel where you do the refining of the ethylene oxide and then get it as a top product and then from the bottoms if at all any he heavy ends are there they will be separated out. So, this process we have seen now this ethylene oxide we take uh, as a raw material and then you react with water to get ethylene glycol that is we are discussing now. So, now we discuss ethylene glycol. It is a major petrochemical and used in antifreeze and then fibers and films production up to 40 and then 50 percent respectively that much it is used. So, most of the ethylene glycol is going for these two products. Like other alcohols it was originally prepared by reacting chlorine in water with ethylene to form chlorohydrine which was then hydrolyzed to produce uh, glycol. Other procedures include uh, formaldehyde reacting with CO2 to give ethylene glycol and then fermentation and oxidation of uh, propene these kind of reactions are there to produce uh, so called ethylene glycol ok. These procedures are now technically and economically obsolete because current pressure whatever is there that is uh, hydration of ethylene oxide is uh, both technically and economically more favorable because of uh, uh, that method whatever these methods are there they are not even being used nowadays ok. In the present method ethylene reacts with oxygen or air as just discussed in a tubular reactor over silver oxide catalyst to form ethylene oxide first. Then because of the uh, volatility of glycol is low it is preferable to purify the ethylene oxide and then convert it to glycol by hydration of purified ethylene oxide. So, whatever this ethylene oxides you get you purify it and then do the hydration reaction to get ethylene glycol. 
during the hydration polyglycols especially di and triethylene glycols are also formed. The reaction for production of ethylene glycol are the first one is nothing but the reaction for production of ethylene oxide where ethylene reacts with oxygen or oxidation of ethylene takes place in the presence of uh, silver oxide catalyst at 250 to 300 degree centigrade and 4 to 5 atmosphere to get a ethylene oxide along with CO2 and then H2O vapors. This ethylene oxide after purifying if you do the hydration then you can get ethyl glycol along with it some kind of polyglycols byproducts also forms. During the process ethylene dichloride is added to mixture of ethylene and air in the ratio of 1 is to 10 to reduce CO2 formation that is one of the engineering problem that we have already discussed. What happens if CO2 formation is more it acts as a inert and then occupies most of the reactor space or uh, interstitial space between the particles within the tube which is packed with the AgO catalyst. So, then there would not be enough space for the reactants to pass through and then uh, react to produce the required uh, ethylene oxide. So, this CO2 formation has to be reduced for that purpose EDC is in general used traces of EDC in general used that we know in the previous lecture where we discussed engineering problems of ethylene oxide manufacture. Then the mixture is passed over a supported silver oxide catalyst uh, at atmospheric pressure and 280 degrees centigrade with 1 second of contact time. It can be varying like you know 250 to 300 degree centigrade even 4 to 5 atmospheres are also uh, possible, but uh, mostly reaction is carried out at atmospheric pressure. This leads to 60 to 70 percent conversion of ethylene giving rise to ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide is removed from the effluent by water scrubbing as discussed in the flow chart and then unreacted constituents are separated and recirculated to the reactor. So, once you have this ethylene oxide which is uh, purified after removing water vapors, unreacted ethylene, oxygen and then light ends, water vapor etc., heavy ends are all everything is been removed and then you get purified ethylene oxide. Once you get the purified ethylene oxide, then liquid phase conversion of ethylene oxide to glycol takes place by using water, but for this reaction you need dilute sulfuric acid solution as catalyst at 60 degree centigrade. But though you are using sulfuric acid, the reaction rate is slow and then it requires 30 minutes to 1 hour. And then usually it is done in the batch reactor or continuous state tank reactors. An excess of water is used and the mono, di and tri ethylene glycols are separated by vacuum distillation. Okay. How it is done? It is done in a continuous reactor distillation integral part. Okay. The reaction is very simple, so that is the reason we are not having the flow chart for this one. Okay. So, now we discuss about ethanol amines. If you remember a few lectures before, uh, ethanol amines were used as a kind of uh, solvent to absorb some, some kind of impurity gases especially acidic gases. Right? For that purpose ethanol amines were used as a solvents. Right? So, this we have already seen in this course uh, for some of the gases absorption, but mostly it was uh, seen several times in the inorganic chemical technology course. Uh, which is also available on NPTEL MOOCs portal. right? So, there we have seen several times it has been used uh, this ethanol amine has been used to absorb some kind of impurity gases like H2S etc. Okay? Then after that stripping has been done to purify the ethanol amines uh, to remove the absorbed H2S and then purified ethanol amines are uh, recirculated back for the absorption purpose. Okay? So, but that is one of the application. Other application also if you remember it is used in the soaps and detergents uh, manufacturing in general where fats are in general reacts with the ethanol amines to give the uh, fatty uh, acid salts etc. So, from which you can prepare the uh, detergents or soaps etc. That is what also we have discussed. So, these are the two important applications of ethanol amines. Okay? So, but how to produce them that is what we are going to discuss now. 
it is obviously by the name ethanol amine so that amine is there so whenever amine functional group is there ammonolysis reaction is in general taken place or you know applied this is also series reaction okay like you know uh, uh, chloro uh, methanes you know series reaction here also it is similar kind of series reaction is there okay so but however before going to the production details we'll have a, a comparison of the properties so that we can understand their importance okay so monoethanolamine diethanolamine triethanolamine as you move from the mono to di di to triethanolamines obviously their molecular weight would increase boiling points of these compounds also increases and then density also increases right so you can see boiling point uh, for the diethanolamine and triethanolamine beyond 270 it de decomposes triethanolamine beyond 360 it decomposes okay only monoethanol is having uh, 170.5 degrees centigrade of a boiling point what does it mean by so if you wanted to separate this because this is a series reaction so then all these three products would be forming of course, your catalyst reaction condition should be selected such a way that as per your product requirement, whether you need more monoethanolamine or more diethanolamine or more triethanolamine, accordingly you have to fix the conditions, that is a different thing. But all of them would definitely be present whatever the conditions you take. So, separation is required. Okay? The appearance uh, mostly colorless monoethanolamine moderately viscous oil whereas uh, diethanolamine colorless crystals at 20 degree centigrade, triethanolamine pale yellow oil is the appearance. Order mild ammoniacal order or slightly ammoniacal order is possible. Solubility monoethanolamine soluble in water, alcohol, chloroform, ethers but slightly soluble in benzene. Whereas diethanolamine is soluble in water and alcohol but slightly soluble in ether and then insoluble in benzene. These two are insoluble in benzene, even the third one also triethanolamine also insoluble in benzene whereas the monoethanolamine is soluble in benzene. Right, flash point you know 95, 138 degree centigrade. Purity different uh, grades purities are there 80 to 98 percent containing higher amines and water here right and then 94 to 95 percent uh, containing mono and triethanol amines as impurities and then here triethanol amine 80 percent technical grade is available with approximately 2 percent monoethanol amine and 15 percent diethanol amine as the impurities that is one grade and then high purity 98 percent triethanol amine is also available okay Consumption pattern if you see ethanol amines are valuable products whose main use is in manufacture of detergents by reaction with fatty acids. Ethanol amine can be used directly in gas purification to remove undesired acidic components. Fatty acid salts of ethanol amines can be used as components of soaps and cosmetic creams. Ethanol amines may be used as intermediates in manufacture of morpholine and then ethylene imine and ethylene diamine also. Methods of production only one basic process is there that is the reaction of ethylene oxide and ammonia. Okay? Chemical reactions, a set of complex series of uh, reactions exist and product ratio depends on the conditions used. Let us say you have one mole of ethylene oxide reacting with ammonia to give monoethanolamine this monoethanol amine is reacting with uh, one more uh, mole of ethylene oxide to give diethanol amine. This diethanol amine is reacting with one more mole of uh, ethylene oxide to give triethanol amine. So, it is a series reaction. So, when you take a you know ethylene oxide and an ammonia mixture and do the reaction. So, all these mono, di and triethanol amines are going to form because it is a series reaction. Okay? Quantitative requirements, basis 1 tons of uh, mixed ethanol amines if you want to produce. Let us say for example, 70 percent mono ethanol amine, 25 percent di ethanol amine and 5 percent tri ethanol amine with the 95 percent ethylene oxide utilization. Then ethylene oxide you required 0.81 tons, ammonia 0.24 tons, plant capacity usually 15 to 50 tons per day, 
process description if you see ethylene oxide and aqueous ammonia solution having 20 to 30 percent ammonia are fed to a state tank reactor, simple reactor. So, wherever this ammonia involved and in, uh, such kind of ammoniolysis reactions are taking place, so then lot of heat would be evaluated. So, that heat has to be controlled by providing the reactor with a jocketed system through which you can circulate cold water to control the temperature of the reactor as per the requirement. This reactor can be operated under a wide range of conditions depending on the product distribution as per your product distribution you are required of a mono, di or tri ethanol amine accordingly you have to make the process conditions. Ammonolysis is exothermic and heat must be uh, removed and recovered. Product stream is flash to remove ammonia for recycle because ammonia wherever is there the conversion is not so easy. It takes high temperature, high pressure and then catalyst in general and then despite of that one the complete conversion may not take place in most of the cases wherever this such kind of ammonolysis reactions are occurring. Same may be true here also so that ammonia has to be uh, removed from the product mixture by the uh, flash operation right and then that uh, ammonia can be recycled. Bottoms contain a water solution of amines which are separated in 4 fractionating columns last 2 operating under vacuum. So, this is the flow chart here. Now, whatever the ethylene oxide is there that you can compress and then ammonia solution whatever is there you make a 20 to 30 percent ammonia solution. Both of them you take to a state tank reactor. Here the required reaction takes place right. So, but the reaction evolve lot of heat also for that purpose in order to keep the reaction temperature conditions as per the requirement water is being circulated. Uh, outside of the reactor through jackets, right. So, whatever the product mixture is there that would be having unreacted ammonia obviously because ammonia conversion is not easy. So, that mixture is passed through ammonia flash to recover the ammonia and then that ammonia can be taken as a recycle. After that what you do? Uh, in the reaction lot of water formation also takes place. So, water separation tower the reaction mixture after ammonia flash is sent to water separation tower where lot of the water is separated out. In this process some of the ammonia is also separated out. In other words you know when you do the partial condensation you get ammonia solution right that can also be recycled back to the reactor. Whereas, the bottom of the uh, water separation tower whatever is there that would be crude ethanol amines, it will be having mixture of a mono, di and tri ethanol amines along with the heavy ends also would be there, right. So, this you pass through sequence of a, uh, mono tower, di tower and tri tower, these towers are nothing but the fractionators, right. So, the first one is the distillation column, here your operating conditions would be roughly uh, you know 170, 165, 170 degrees centigrade so that whatever the uh, monoethanol amine is there. So, its a, its boiling point is 171. So, most of the monoethanol amine would be uh, going as a vapor in the top product and then that can be condensed and collected as a monoethanol amine. Whereas, the now bottoms would be di and tri ethanol amines. plus uh, heavy and should be there. They will be taken to the di and uh, tri tower. So, these are no, nothing but the vacuum uh, fractionators, right. So, because here they decompose uh, beyond 270 degree centigrade, uh, di ethanol amine decompose and then beyond 360 degree centigrade tri ethanol amine decompose. So, then it, it they do not undergo boiling. So, you have to do the vacuum fractionation. So, in the first vacuum fractionator the conditions are maintained such a way that diethanol amine is collected at the top as a top product and then from the bottom you will be having triethanol amine and then heavy ends mixture. So, that you can take to another vacuum fractionator where the conditions are maintained such a way that triethanol amine you can get it as a top product whereas, the heavy ends are collected from the bottom. So, the process is simple, simple reaction 
removing or recovering the unreacted ammonia solution etc re recycling back to the reactor and then after that doing the uh, separation of the products okay that is the process very simple process major engineering problems four main issues are there one is the kinetics of complex uh, series reactions. So, let us say whenever we have series reaction, if you remember uh, A goes to B, B goes to C kind of series reaction. So, now here uh, this is what you are having, you are having ammonia plus ethylene oxide you are having. Now, you are getting monoethanolamine that reacts with uh, ethylene oxide again and to give uh, diethanolamine. This diethanolamine reacts with uh, ethylene oxide again to give triethanolamine. This kind of series reaction is taking place. So, for such kind of series reaction, if you plot concentration of reactants in products versus time, what you have? Let us say the concentration of uh, ammonia and then ethylene gradually decreases, ethylene oxide uh, concentration and ammonia concentration gradually decreases. But which one decreases uh, more and then which one decreases less that is again depends on their conversion. As we already know that ammonia conversion is uh, very uh, difficult, so more uh, ammonia reduction, concentration of ammonia reduction would be less uh, or less ammonia would be participating in the reaction compared to the other uh, component. In this case other component is nothing but uh, ethylene oxide. So, this is ammonia. Okay? So, this is how the qualitatively also when you present you have to present systematically. You cannot say the top curve is uh, for ethylene oxide and then second curve is the ammonia like that, you cannot say that. So, about the products, uh, first monoethanol amine, so that concentration is very less small initially and then gradually its concentration increases as the reaction progresses, but as the reaction proce progresses that monoethanol amine reacts with the uh, one mole of ethylene oxide to produce uh, diethanol amine. So, after certain time its concentration gradually decreases like this. So, there would be a maxima kind of thing, right. So, because of that one monoethanol amine is having like this kind of concentration profile. But initially, uh, uh, diethanol amine concentration is also very low and then it gradually increases, it gradually increases and then uh, that depends on how much monoethanol amine is reacting with the uh, ethylene oxide to give diethanol amine, right. So, its concentration also increases gradually, but after, uh, you know as its concentration increases this diethanol amine also reacts with the uh, ethylene oxide to give triethanol amine. So, after certain point its concentration also decreases something like this. So, this is you know diethanol amine. Whereas, the triethanol amine its concentration is very small uh, uh, negligible for initial period of time and then but it gradually its concentration increases. It, it concentration gradually increases with time, but it does not decrease because after triethanol amine it is not being consumed by any of the reactants or any of the uh, other products. So, such kind of uh, uh, reaction kinetics are possible uh, in the series reactions like this and then of course, this can be taken as one of the example of a series reaction. Same is true in the chloromethanes preparation also, they also you know undergo series reaction, methane and then chlorine undergo series reaction to give different types of chloromethanes. At constant temperature and pressure, mono and diethanol amine concentration increases and then decreases as explained here, whereas triethanol amine concentration increases with time of reaction as shown here, okay, as explained. So, depending on product distribution, average residence time can be obtained by plotting concentration versus time plots of reaction and products. Let us say you need to have more of uh, monoethanol amine. So, then you try to fix the uh, maximum resistance time uh, up to this one only. So, that there would not be sufficient time for the monoethanol amine to react with ethylene, with ethylene oxide to form a more of the uh, diethanol amine. So, this kind of if you want let us say a more of the diethanol amine, so then you have to make sure that resistance time accordingly like this. Okay? Then reactor design is also one of the important thing. 
If rate constants are available then computerized optimization can be done. Best options for uh, ammonia to ethylene oxide ratio is 0.5 to 3 temperature 35 to 275 degrees centigrade it's very broad that is the reason computerized optimization is required whereas the pressure is also very high 1 to 100 atmosphere. So, these wide conditions wide range of conditions are provided they can be best option but you know you have to do more optimization as per your requirement. Third one is process alternatives when more of di and triethanol amines are required then better to recycle lower amines to a separate reactor where only ethylene oxide is used right. Too low ammonia ratio in one pass reactor gives amino ethers. These can be suppressed by addition of CO2 and this technique is often used to rather recycle process. Fourth one is the recovery and purification of the system. So, that is another important engineering problem. High boiling point of di and tri compounds with decomposition that is the problem not only high boiling point temperatures for these two components, but also they undergo decomposition and also color deterioration takes place with the temperature. The separation of dye and tri components require more expensive vacuum fractionation system rather simple distillation column. Compounds are too similar in properties also, so it is diffi difficult to do separation by solvent extraction also. If the distillation is not possible by certain reason like you know uh, decomposition with the temperature or you know close boiling point of the components that are present in the mixture, then solvent extraction may be thought of. But that is also not possible in this case because the properties of di and tri ethanol amines are you know, you know very similar to each other. Okay? So, that is what about the production of uh, ethanol amines. Now, we discuss about production of acetaldehyde. It is one of the most important tonnage petrochemical. It is raw material for production of uh, several compounds like acetic acid, acetic anhydride, acetate esters, etc. The conventional process was hydration of uh, acetylene that is acetylene and water reaction in the presence of liquid sulfuric acid catalyst. As per the reaction, the acetylene reacts with water in the presence of H2SO4 to give acetaldehyde. This is the conventional process. The new process was announced where lower cost ethylene was used as raw material and produced acetaldehyde at much lower cost compared to the previous one. And then reaction was also simple, just you take a ethylene and do the oxidation you get acetaldehyde. So, this process was so uh, better economically that immediately other process were obsoleted. Okay? Process operates in the presence of an aqueous liquid copper salt catalyst promoted by metals such as palladium. So, thus there are generally two reaction process that is hydration reaction and catalyst regeneration reaction. In the hydration reaction, the first uh, ethylene reacts with uh, water in the presence of catalyst to give acetaldehyde, right? And then Second reaction is that whatever the uh, 2 C, CuCl2 is there that is converted into 2 CuCl. That 2 CuCl reacts with the 2 HCl in the presence of oxygen, then you regenerate the catalyst. Actually, this is nothing but catalyst regeneration by oxidation reaction. Right? From the product mixture, whatever the acetaldehyde you separate and then re remaining ones whatever are there that you react with uh, uh, oxygen or do the oxidation then you can regenerate your catalyst. Okay? So, overall reaction is that C2H4 plus half O2 is CH3OH, but it is actually two step reactions are there like this. Otherwise, every batch you have to give the fresh catalyst and then wasting disposing CuCl, HCl is another problem. So, catalyst regeneration is always essential and then beneficial both from technical as well as economical point of view and that is being satisfied here. This process is operated at pressures less than 50 atmosphere and then at temperatures 50 to 100 degrees centigrade, but the time is slightly higher 60 to 40 minutes. Tower type uh, reactors are used as shown in the picture, uh, we are discussing in the next slide, but however the yields are very high up to 96 percent. So, this is the 
set up for the production of acetaldehyde from the ethylene. So, here what you do ethylene you take through compressor and then whatever the uh, Cu, Cl2 and then H2O is required that you pass through a pump from the bottom of the reactor. In the reactor required reaction takes place and then reactor mixture or whatever is there that is taken to a cyclone separator. So, the products whatever are there uh, which are lighter ones they are taken to the product separator and then required separation is done to get the uh, you know whatever the final product that you are expecting to have here acetaldehyde. Whereas, the bottoms of uh, cyclone separator would be the heaviest one they would be taken to a stripper where the steam is applied directly to the mixture. So, that if at all any uh, water vapor etcetera and then uh, still acetaldehyde etcetera are there they will be evaporated and collected from the top and then sent to the product separator to uh, recover more of the acetaldehyde. Okay? Then from the bottom of the stripper whatever you get that is primarily nothing but CuCl plus HCl plus H2O mixture that you take to the regenerator which is also a tower type reactor to which you supply oxygen and then do the oxidation. So, here you what you get you get the most of the uh, products like Cu, Cl2 plus H2O etcetera. So, that you take to the cyclone separator here. From here whatever the unreacted oxygen or the gases etcetera are there they will be collected from the top and then fed back to the compressor and then recirculated back to the regenerator. Whereas, from the bottom primarily you get Cu, Cl2 and then water mixture that is nothing but the contact solution that you can take it back to the reactor as a recycle through pump. So, that more reaction takes place. So, here this here the you can call it as hydration reactor this you call it as catalyst regeneration reactor. Both of them are tower type reactors as shown here. Okay. Last uh, chemical that we are producing from a uh, C2 compound is vinyl estate. Actually n number of are there we have selected a few in the selected ones vinyl estate is the last one. It is another example of a C2 petrochemical where ethylene is threatening to displace estylene as raw material. Actually earlier estylene was used as a raw material to produce a vinyl estate, but nowadays uh, ethylene is being used and then vinyl estate is produced at much cheaper cost. Traditional process involves reaction of estylene and then estic acid as per the reaction like estylene reacting with the estic acid to give vinyl estate. Now, New route which is being installed commercially involves vinyl estate production directly from ethylene. Right? So, here in this process different variants are there. One of the variants is ethylene and then estic acids are uh, reacting together to give vinyl estate. But however, in addition to ethylene and then estic acid you also require oxygen for this reaction. Okay? So, this process is being found uh, more technically more uh, feasible techno economically. So, people are following these kind of trends. There is another uh, variant in which oxyesterification process is carried out in the presence of palladium chloride catalyst where you know different reactions take place. In this variant ethylene and oxygen are only reacts where acetaldehyde and then acetic acid being formed during the process as per the below reaction. Right. Actually, you know ethylene here is reacting with the acetic acid in the pre along with the oxygen to give vinyl estate. So, now, but this uh, acetic acid from where are we getting? We are getting from the acetaldehyde. First, you know acetaldehyde being produced and then that acetaldehyde is being converted into the acetic acid and that acetic acid is reacting with the ethylene. That is the second variant that reactions are given here. So, ethylene oxidation if you do acetaldehyde you get. This acetaldehyde will be further oxidized to acetic acid. This acetic acid will react with the ethylene and then oxygen to give vinyl acetate. Okay? 
So, overall reaction is that 2 moles of ethylene reacts with 1.5 moles of oxygen to give vinyl acetate. Okay. Vinyl acetate monomer is used as intermediate in manufacture of uh, several products like uh, polyvinyl alcohol, polyvinyl acetate, polyvinyl formal, polyvinyl butyryl etc. These polymers are water white, water soluble resins used in manufacture of adhesives, paper coatings, emulsifiers, surface coatings, molding materials. These polymers are also used for the lacquers, textile finishing agents, printing axillaries, chemicals, safety glasses, etc. It is having so many applications. So, now we can see ethylene is having uh, you know option like you know you can produce number of chemicals compared to the ethylene and then propylene other kind of olefins. That is the reason ethylene is the most important olefin from the synthetic chemical industries point of view. Okay? References for today's lecture are provided here. Outlines of chemical technology by Dryden, edited and revised by Gopal Rao and Marshall, third edition. Chemical process industries by Austin and Shreve, fifth edition. Encyclopedia of chemical technology by Kirk and Atmar, fourth edition. Unit processes in organic synthesis by Groggins, fifth edition. Thank you. Thank you.